Hey there, welcome to another episode of A Different Perspective. Now in the last couple episodes, we were focusing on gear. And in this episode, we're gonna bring it back to more of the fundamentals of photography and talk about composition techniques. So other than just owning a camera, composition is probably the most fundamental aspect of photography. It literally is talking about how to find a different perspective or to go at something from a different angle. That's literally 90% of what photography is. Learning composition is one of those things that can really help you create compelling images. So today we're going to talk about a few of the composition techniques that we practice every day. So I'll start us off with the first compositional technique of framing. Framing is all about using your surroundings to either frame your subject or point of interest in your photo. Some examples of this can be structural objects like doorways, archways, tunnels, or fences. Now in nature, some things that we can use are trees, tree branches, leaves, tall grass, or things like flowers. And something else to keep in mind is that it doesn't just have to be in the foreground of your image. You can use any of those examples in the background or the same plane as your subject. So the first step to finding an angle or a composition that works a little bit better than standard is to consider your height and your orbit around your subject to help create the frame that Kyle was talking about. And sometimes it's not a literal frame. Maybe there is no object that you're placing your subject in. Maybe it's just the sky or maybe it's just their surroundings. But the big thing with this is to not just be stagnant and standing straight up and take your picture, but to think about your subject should it be portrait? Should it be landscape? Should you raise yourself higher or put yourself lower so that your subject really stands out in the frame using contrast and keeping that in mind as you shift your body? Leading lines help draw the viewer's eyes to a specific point in your photo. Now, this is also a technique that if you remember, we used in our one point perspective photo challenge. Now with my photo, I use the railings of the bridge to draw your eye in towards the center of the frame. And then in John's example, he used the structural architecture of the building to draw your eyes up toward the sky. Other things that we can use as leading lines can be paths, patterns, streets, or rivers. And one other thing to mention about leading lines is they don't always have to be straight. You can use a curved path, road, or river as long as it just draws your eyes toward that subject. So the next rule, which you have no doubt heard of by now, is called the rule of thirds. And what it is, is basically a very simple layout on your screen. Sometimes it's even an overlay on your camera that shows you different points on your composition that can create a more dynamic look. And the rule of thirds is probably the most basic of the different types of layouts you can try to build your composition off of. Everybody uses it. Everybody thinks about it. Artists use it in their art and their illustrations. And it's, it's everywhere. Once you have learned that it exists, you'll see it in almost every frame you look at. Even if it's as simple as something straight down the middle and it's very symmetrical, technically they're using the center third in a way. Another good use case for the rule of thirds is it helps guide your horizon line. So without the rule of third on your camera, it's very common even for experienced photographers to not get the horizon just right all the time. And you know, that could be a creative decision, but more often than not, it's a mistake when the horizon line is slanted and it has to be corrected in post. So using the rule of thirds in your camera or getting used to getting that perfect horizon line will help you reduce cropping and post-production processes and just make your photos feel a lot more balanced and a little less wonky. So the rule of thirds is definitely something that we keep in the back of our minds all the time and it almost becomes second nature to photographers and videographers as they do their work. Something that goes a little bit deeper than the rule of thirds is called the golden spiral or the golden ratio. And you've probably seen this everywhere. At first, you might think it's a little bit silly, but all it is really doing is adding a sense of scale that you can use in contrast. So you've got your third, but you've also got the spiral getting smaller and smaller and lining things up on that spiral or scale can make for some very interesting and very balanced feeling pictures. 
I personally wouldn't say that the golden spiral is something that I think about all the time. There are some cameras that you can overlay onto, but it's definitely something to think about, especially when it comes to adding contrast in your composition with scale, like having your subject really tiny in a big old field or having your subject look really huge and the space is really cramped. So it depends on what you're going for, but it's definitely something to think about, especially when you get a little more creative into your photography journey. Now, the next one we'll talk about is negative space. Negative space is all about using minimalism to isolate your subject. Essentially, what you can think about with negative space is it's the space around your subject, which is the positive in the photo. The goal here with negative space is to remove all distractions from the photo so you know exactly when you look at that photo what your subject is. Now you can have other elements in your photo with your subject, just make sure they blend in with the background. So you may notice that a lot of these composition techniques, in fact, kind of all of them blend together. And uh, you'll also notice my background changed here because I just wanted to show off the extreme case of negative space. But uh, that also kind of leads into isolating your subject. And there are so many ways to do that, but the primary way is through contrast. But contrast can mean a lot of things. It can mean, it could mean luma contrast, so having brightness and darkness separate your subject from your background. It could be color contrast. It could be scale contrast, like I mentioned with the golden spiral. So there's a lot of different things to think about, and you could use one or multiple contrast forms to separate your subject. Another way is with focus. So if your depth of field is really shallow, you could blur the background out. And that's great for situations where you can't really control the background elements as much. And there's a lot more to it, but just think about all the different ways you can create contrast to make your photo more dynamic and interesting and draw your viewer's eye to the subject. Now our next technique is eliminating distractions. And this is similar to negative space where you're essentially taking all of the distractions away from the subject. Now some examples that will help you accomplish this technique are filling your frame, using a neutral background, using flash or a backlight to isolate your subject, or even shooting up toward the sky. Okay, so now it's time for a little bit more of an advanced concept, and it's really not that advanced. It kind of continues to tie in with the rest, but a lot of people don't even know what this is. And it's a visual tangent or avoiding visual tangents. And what a tangent is, is basically anything in the picture that feels uncomfortable. And as you start to recognize them, you'll start to understand what is really a tangent and what isn't. So an easy example I can give you is if I'm up here and I'm, I'm, my head is just barely touching the top of the frame, but it's not really cropped out or in, if, if that's a tangent, it's a little awkward. Another example of a tangent is when something is touching the subject in an uncomfortable way. Now, if you have plenty of depth of field, like I tried to, produce here, this isn't as big of an issue and it's, it's symmetrical, so it's kind of forgiven. But if I were to crank down on my aperture and this was all sharp in the background, it would look a lot more uncomfortable because I've got this shelf running right through my ears and like this thing sticking out of the top of my head. This may be not this may not be an ideal backdrop, but that is also a, considered a tangent. So just like trying to find negative space, creating a good buffer between your subject and your background and whatnot, uh, you can use the knowledge of tangents to help eliminate them so that random things aren't creating discomfort within your frame. One thing you'll notice as you start practicing these composition techniques in your photography or filmmaking is they'll start to become more natural for you. And these just help you develop a better understanding of what makes a good image. Okay, so hopefully those little tips help you in your next endeavor and with the upcoming challenge. But before we get there, let's talk about last episode's challenge and see how we accomplished and edited our pictures. What you got, Kyle? All right, guys. So this was my photo that I ended up choosing for the fixed focal length challenge. Once again, Jean and I challenged each other to shoot wide angle while we were doing that. But you could shoot any fixed focal length that you wanted to. You just had to stay on that. So I chose to stay with 24 millimeters the entire time I was out shooting. And this is, again, the image that I ended up with. 
All right, now going into the actual editing behind this photo, uh, first of all, let me show you where I started off with. So this is the original, and this is what I ended up with for my final edit. Now for the light, it's pretty similar to what I've done for other challenges where just boosted the exposure slightly, uh, boosted the contrast, was going for a moody contrasty image, lowered the highlights all the way down to negative 100, boosted the shadows quite a bit to make up for that as well in the shadows. Whites lowered those quite a bit and the blacks just a little bit as well. Now, something that I started messing around with and trying to familiarize myself with was the curves here, the tone curves. And normally I'd just go in here and I, I'm pretty sure I just did this for the other edits. I put in a slight S curve and just went on to um, the color mixer and the color. But this time I really wanted to start using this, start playing around with it and, and see what I could come up with. This was what I started off with, um, just with messing around with the saturation in the color mixer. Now, when I started going into and diving deeper into the point curves or the tone curves, I went into the individual channels here. So in the red channel, I made a similar S curve, but I put some more uh, points in there. Same thing with the green and the blue. That's where I started getting a lot of those, uh, the colors that I wanted to pop in the image and just getting a desirable uh, image, end image for what I wanted for the edit, what I was going for. All right, so moving on to the color, I again wanted this to still be a cooler image, um, speaking about temperature, so I dropped the temperature quite a bit and then left everything else the same here. And then back to saturation, uh, this is what I ended up with. Took a lot of the blue and greens out of here. I uh, dropped the, I desaturated the orange a little bit here too. Um, just to get a more desirable look to the yellow lines or those orange lines that are painted on the road. I really liked the way they looked when I was dropping that orange all the way down. And then luminance just played around with those slightly. And then for the effects, just added some texture and clarity, a little bit of dehaze in there. Added a tiny bit of grain as well. Sharpening. This is again something that I like to boost all the way and then put some masking on there just to get the lines of the buildings, the edges of the buildings, and then some of the snow as well, but not all of the image. And that was my edit. And once again, here's the before and the after. All right, so for my wide angle challenge, I actually decided to take a time lapse and the time lapse isn't my submission, but I did a wide angle shot and it was really awesome. So these are pictures of the sunset from Thanksgiving night and it was really neat. It kind of started out with this like golden clouds here and the sun was just over the horizon. And then towards the middle, what's really awesome is these clouds got super fiery and vibrant and it's just like, really really pretty uh, and so I wanted to really show off that red and, and contrast it with blue so we'll go over that in just a minute um, and then towards the end you can see it just darkens and gets all blue um, and that transition was really awesome so uh, I'm going to go ahead and choose one of these middle ones here as an example and show you how I edited them and what I really wanted to do was contrast this super vivid red with the sky, which actually if I go to the before, you can see it was more of an orangey, uh, a little less whimsical than I, I edited it to be, but I really wanted to contrast red versus blue in the shadows. So I used some color mixing and stuff, which we'll go through now. Um, but yeah, here, here's the edit where I came up with uh, what I came up with there. It was really pretty straightforward. So I started out as usual from switching from Adobe Color to Adobe Landscape just to kind of bring in more vibrance and clamp the highlights and shadows a little bit better. I do this for pretty much every landscape. It actually works really, really well if I'm not using a color checker or anything like that. Uh, and then 
I went ahead and in light, <clears throat> I boosted the contrast a lot, which is something I commonly don't do. Usually I use shadows and highlights, but I'm kind of playing with highlights and shadows being boosted and cut um, and instead using the contrast to try to retain detail. So it's kind of like a push and pull between all these. So I'm actually reducing contrast by bringing the highlights down, which actually helps bring out the details in the highlights here. And then I boost the shadows to try to bring out all the details in like these parts, like in these clouds over here. Then what I do is because the contrast is kind of flattened at that point is I reintroduce it. Uh, and I boosted it about 50 and that way I was able to retain the highlights and the shadows while also keeping that contrasty look, or at least that's what I was going for. In this particular image, curves didn't really seem to do anything for me. Uh, I didn't, I, I usually like to try to boost gamma and stuff, but I realized I started to lose detail because it's such a dynamic scene. So I just didn't use any curves, which was actually kind of interesting for me. Uh, for the color, I want it to be super vibrant, so I boosted the vibrance up to 35, and I did quite a bit in the color mixing, so um, I'll just start from red, nothing. So in orange, I took the hue to negative 9 just to shift it a little more red, and then really cranked the saturation, saturation and luminance. You can see if I turn off the color mixer and turn it back on, uh, I really kind of wanted to give more of a, like, punchy look to the reds and so I, I kind of boosted those oranges shifted them to be more red same thing with yellow shifted it to be a little more orange desaturated them and actually brought down the luminance and that helped with this part in the sky from uh being so like bright yellow and made it a little more like a tame golden creamy yellow uh, and then I took the blues and I shifted them a little bit more towards the cyan so that I got a bit more of like a fanciful looking thing. And I pulled the luminance down and the saturation so that I really kind of contrasted this. It wasn't so bright compared to this bright red spot. So that's the color mixer. And then in the color grading wheels, I went ahead and took the hue to uh, the, from the shadows to this like deep blue color. And I really wanted to contrast that with the red. So I'm again, enhancing that color contrast here. And I put a little bit of saturation and I actually darkened it quite a bit. In the mids, this was also blue. This is where we get more of this teal look here. So if I turn the color mix off back on, you can see what it's doing. So these mids are actually also blue, but they're more of a cyan-y blue instead of like a deep blue. And that just helped those mid tones uh, kind of transition in, into the red a little bit better. And then in the highlights, I added yellow. So if I could turn that off, turn it back on, uh, it, it doesn't seem to do a ton, but it is helping separate the blue from the reds a little bit more, which is pretty cool. So if I pull down the saturation of this, kind of see what's changing there. And it's not a lot, it's not a lot, but it's pretty nice. All right, then for the effects, I just crank the texture up to 44 and that just really helped to bring out the detail in the clouds up there. So if I zoom in here, you could probably see it better. But yeah, just really kind of separating those details of the clouds. And then I increased the sharpness a little bit just to also accentuate the edges of the clouds. And I did a little bit of masking, not a lot, just to, you know, take noise out of these flat spots, but leave all the sharpness in, in the cloud detail. Cool. And then I just removed chromatic aberration, and enabled lens corrections, and that's basically it. So you can see the before again and the after. And that is my submission. All right, so now it is time for this episode's photo challenge. In this episode, I'm actually gonna borrow something that we just talked about, and that's all about framing. Oh, framing. I was, I was way off in my guess. All right, so even though we talked about it earlier in the episode, uh, framing is all about using elements in your frame to frame your subject. So to be specific about the challenge, I think what Kyle means, and you let me know if I'm wrong, but are we talking like putting a frame within the frame, like literally having the subject framed by something in the image? Not uh, like using an actual like 
picture frame or anything like that. It's just finding an element outdoors or inside that you can frame your subject with. Thanks for watching this episode of A Different Perspective. Now, as we just mentioned with the photo challenge, we put these photo challenges out there to get you guys involved. And we wanna see what you guys are doing and you guys participating in these photo challenges. So something that we've been doing lately is on Instagram, when you guys post these photos, we'll share those right to our stories, as well as in future episodes, we also want to include everyone's photos at the end of every episode. So be sure when you're posting your photos on Instagram to tag our account at a different perspective.tv and also use the hashtag a different perspective TV when you post those. So we'll be notified and see what you guys are coming up with. Yeah, we definitely want you to be involved and we are doing this so that we can build a community of people who are wanting to learn and grow together and to also know that no matter what level you're at, we're here to help each other and to just build a culture around photography. So be sure to like and subscribe and click the bell icon so that in the next episode you're notified when the challenge goes live and you can be involved right away. But don't be afraid to go back and try previous challenges. We'll still feature your picture even if you're a little bit late on that, so no worries. And with that, with everything, we'll see you in a place, somewhere, sometime, in the future. <laughs>